On the morning of the 5th of April this year, I woke up and I saw close to 100 hate messages from both far-right and Islamist extremist sympathizers on my Twitter feed. So instead of starting the day with a nice good morning message, I had received accusations, insults and even threats. It was the day after I had published my first opinion article in The Independent on the very controversial topic of Charlie Hebdo. But quite foolishly, my first reaction must have been something like, oh great, people are actually reading my article. <laughs> and it was only after the leaders of both UK Pegida and a major Islamist extremist network started attacking me simultaneously that I began to feel a tiny bit uncomfortable. But still, I thought at least if all the extremists are upset, I must have gotten it right, right? And then something weird happened, something that really confused me. A bizarre dynamic developed between the far-right and Islamist extremists as they started interacting with each other and using each other's arguments against me. First, I couldn't believe it. Were the far-right and Islamist extremists actually teaming up against me? That seemed so absurd. But then, when taking a closer look at what they were actually tweeting, I started to realize that it made perfect sense, because they were essentially telling the same story, just from a different perspective, while I was the one telling a different story. And I mean, I don't tend to pay compliments to extremists, but if there's one thing that they're just damn good at, it's telling stories. The art of storytelling and creating common narratives is more powerful than anything else. A power struggle is nothing else than a competition for who tells the better story. Because the one who determines the dominant narration pattern can mobilize and control the masses. This is not necessarily a bad thing. The creation of common stories, myths and narratives has been an important driver in the evolution of humankind. It has enabled us to cooperate in large numbers and to live together in bigger communities. But it has also been abused and exploited. And unfortunately, this has become a lot easier with the invention of the internet and social media. While centuries ago, stories were developed and passed on over generations, and the development of new narratives was reserved to the most privileged in society, today, literally anyone can spread the story at a global level at light speed. Hypothetically, an Argentinian food critic can provoke a demonstration against matcha-flavored Kit Kats in Japan, unmediated from his bedroom, within a matter of hours. Now, to our detriment, the ones that have capitalized most on these new opportunities are not Argentinian food critics, but are far-right and Islamist extremists. And just one look at the rise of the far right across Europe is enough to see how successful they have been in telling and selling their stories worldwide. Now, why is that? Their first advantage is actually based on simplicity. In an increasingly complex world, black and white narratives that eliminate all confusing gray zones can be comforting. We all love binary worldviews. Just think about the most successful movies in history, Star Wars. You have the light and the, black side and the dark side of the force. It's simple. I even understood that narrative at the age of six and thought it was great. I see someone in the first row also thinks it's great. <laughs> Their second advantage is actually based on generating empathy. Apparently, Showing handsome men who hold kitten against the background of a romantic sunset is not a strategy that is exclusive to dating applications such as Tinder. I took this picture straight from the latest issue of ISIS official propaganda magazine, Der Beek. So as we can see, even Islamist extremists have now started to pick up on this trend. This is what I call the Tinder effect. And well, I guess Trump is trying his best to keep up. I think he still has to work a bit on the being handsome side of things. <laughs> but the goal of this is obvious. In the case of Tinder, Der Beek, and Trump campaigns, it's to generate empathy from the target audience. And it works. Now, the third and probably most important ingredient of extremist success recipes is consistency. While the narratives of the establishment are far from being consistent, 
Just think about France's principles of liberty, egality, and fraternity. No one believes in them anymore since the recent Burkini bans, right? At least Le Pen and ISIS appear to stick to their principles. And in fact, their stories don't just make sense in themselves, they're also consistent with the other extremes' worldview. Islamist extremists tell us the West is at war with Islam, while the far right tells us that Islam is at war with the West. Well, they're perfectly complementary. If we go back to our Star Wars example, whether you are on the light or on the dark side of the, of the force doesn't really change the story. The only thing that does is the perspective. The same is true for far-right and Islamist extremists. They are in the same movie, reinforcing the same story, and thus helping each other as storytellers. Now, let me show you what this looks like in practice, because this is what we call reciprocal radicalization or the connectivity between extremisms. And the symbiosis between far-right and Islamist extremists becomes most obvious when looking at the online space, for example, Twitter, where extremists use the same anti-establishment hashtags and even recite each other. As you can see here, one Twitter user who spreads Islamist extremist rhetoric has set up his account entirely in reference to Tommy Robinson the founder of UK's far-right movement, English Defence League, and now leader of UK Pegida. They are basically identical. ISIS and Al-Shabaab have both used Trump in their propaganda videos, while Marine Le Pen was probed by the police last year for retweeting ISIS materials. So in short, their echo chambers interact and amplify each other's narratives. Now, how about the offline world? Just statistically speaking, we can see a correlation between the occurrence of far-right and Islamist extremist attacks. They seem to spike at roughly the same time. Of course, this doesn't tell us anything about the causality or the exact dynamics behind that correlation. But when we look deeper into some of the cases, we can see some pretty bad reciprocal radicalization hotbeds, even across Europe. The British cities of Portsmouth, Luton, Dewsbury, the French Côte d'Azur, the German Wuppertal. These are all mutual breeding grounds, and some of the dynamics are really concerning. In Luton, for example, we have seen the rise of several far-right and Islamist extremist groups. And in fact, some of their actions have fed directly into the recruiting successes of the others. So yes, maybe after all, it wouldn't be so absurd to see Trump and al-Baghdadi celebrate their triumphs together. Now, what does all this mean for us? It means that we can only win the war of words against extremists if we simultaneously challenge both binary worldviews. It means that the victory of Donald Trump and far-right leaders across Europe might also strengthen the global jihadist insurgency and thus exacerbate the terrorist threat that we face in Western countries. The first keyword here is, of course, education. We need critical thinking to be taught in schools so that our next generations learn to identify the deceptive techniques used by extremist storytellers, to see beyond their black and white narratives that are based on the victimization of the us and the demonization of the other, and to explore the gray zones of reality. The second part of the solution is all about communication. We need to address the big perceptual gap that exists between the media and reality. While far-right extremist attacks are more frequent, Islamist extremist attacks are actually far more often featured in the media. When British MP Joe Cox was murdered by far-right terrorist Tommy Mayer in the wake of the Brexit referendum, the media was reluctant to label this as terrorism. Had the perpetrator shouted Allahu Akbar instead of Britain first, this would have been entirely different, right? Now, this feeds into the hands of extremists who use outrage provoked by things like these to recruit alienated Muslims for the violent causes. All the far right then has to do is translate the fear created by Islamist extremist attacks back into outrage. It's a perfectly coordinated vicious circle. And because we are in a circle, this also means that the before equals the after, meaning that reaction equals prevention, and reaction takes place on all levels politics, the media, civil society. 
We all determine what the after looks like. We all shape the narrative. We, as civil society, as teachers, students, as voters, parents, sons and daughters, need to become more proactive in telling different, better stories that can reunite rather than divide our societies and that emphasize our commonalities rather than our differences. Every story has a protagonist and an antagonist. But who says that the antagonist has to be human? Because as long as the antagonist is human, the logical consequence for collective action is always a war or a genocide. But isn't there an out there idea? What if we replace that human antagonist with an abstract one? A global challenge, for example. We've got more than enough of those. Climate change, poverty, inequality, hunger. If we prefer, we can also take something simpler, like the world against traffic jams, overcooked pasta, or mediocre coffee. Now, out there, there are already some initiatives led by civil society that have been quite successful. The Families Against Terrorism and Extremism Network has brought together families of both jihadists and terrorism victims who have joined forces in fighting their common enemy, hatred. What if we take this as an inspiration for a narrative of humanity against hatred? Now, if that works out, Twitter would be a boring place, and I wouldn't be receiving any hate messages anymore. But that sounds like a good story to me, and one where there could actually be a happy end. So why don't you go out there and tell your own story, and preferably one where humanity does not fight itself, but where it is united against a common threat? Thank you.